Ladies and gentlemen, today I am joined by a very special guest, as you can see. It's the one and only Andy Aspinall. And of course, joined by his, his very, very successful son, the one and only, the newly crowned, minted, the interim heavyweight champion man, the champion of the world, Atherton's own, England's finest, Tom Aspinall. Tom, how does that feel when I say that to you? Yeah, it feels pretty good. Um, job done. Job done for now. More work to do, obviously. Uh, but I got what I set out to achieve, which is UFC heavyweight champion of the world. So very happy about it, but uh, not satisfied. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot more work to do. I want to go down as the best heavyweight ever. So, um, yeah, I'm happy with it all, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, listen, we're going to get into all of that stuff and I want to hear all about it. But um, kept it quiet about the bag. I understand why you would do that. You don't want to put that out there. But um, how badly did you injure it? How did you do that? And how much was it affecting you? Do you know what? I didn't want to bring it up. Even Pulse Fight, it just kind of slipped out, to be honest. And once I said it once, obviously, people get wind of it. So you have to say it on every mm. interview then. Um, it's not an injury. So I didn't injure my back. I just pulled my back. Do you know what I mean? I think we've all been there. Uh, like, it's fine. It's getting better now. It's, it's causing me no problems now. It's not going to be an ongoing thing. I don't need physio. I don't need a surgery or nothing like that. It's not an injury. But, uh, yeah, I just pulled my back and I couldn't move for a few days. I was completely stiff. Um, so, yeah, it's not ideal when you've got a two-week training camp. Do you know what I mean? It's And you've got to travel across the world as well. Like, that takes a lot out of you. So, um, not ideal, but it, it worked. Certainly when you're fighting for the belt, not ideal. Flying to another country, getting the visa, as you mentioned, that's really stressful. Then you got the travel, then you got the jet lag, then you got the injury, then you got the fact that it's Madison Square Garden, then you got the pressure that it's for a world championship, and you're going up against what people thought was the scariest man in potentially all of the UFC. But you handled it. Like a seasoned pro, mate. Listen, I could see you were nervous when you walked out. I was like, oh, he, he looks nervous, which is which is to be expected, of course. And you've been very open. You've been very open about how scared you were. And I've, a lot of people have spoken to me and said they found it so refreshing how open you were because, you know, in, in many different areas of life, people are scared. You know what I mean? But would you just mind elaborating on, on the mindset and the feelings as you were walking out there? Yeah, you know what, I figured out quite a while ago now, as you say, I look like a veteran, but at this point, to be honest, I'm a bit of a veteran, do you know what I mean? I've had a lot of fights, that's my eighth UFC fight, so um, it's not it's not my first rodeo, even though it's my first title shot, um, and yeah, I, I, I have a, like, I always say that I have a good relationship with fear, I don't, I'm not, I'm not scared about being scared, do you know what I mean, like, I realise that it's part of the sport. I don't try and fight it or anything like that. And uh, I think as a big, strong cage fighter, we don't like to speak about stuff like that. But for me, as soon as I accepted it, as soon as I kind of let it into my life, I kind of like let it help me with my uh, with my performances. And, and it really does. I, I definitely was nervous. I definitely was scared. But that's uh, I'm super sharp when I'm like that. Like, as you've seen on Saturday, super, super sharp when, I, when I'm in that mindset. And I don't let it hold me back. Well, it's like Rocky said, you know, that, that, that adrenaline, that fear, that is your friend. You know what I mean? The adrenaline kicks in, heightens all the senses. You move quicker, you're faster, you're deadlier. Andy, for those people that don't know, the man sat right there is your father, your coach, mentor. He's always with you. He's done an incredible job. He's molded you from day one. Andy, did, did you, you know, I, how do I word this? I mean, have you helped craft that mindset in dealing with the fear and all the rest of it along the way? If you send consolation, I saw Pavlich and I was frightened for him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, yeah, we've, uh, geez, we, he started doing this when he was probably eight and we spent millions of hours in cars talking about going to fights or having fights or, and you, you pay people for that, don't you? And it, it's not paid me. Um, I, I think... <laughs> I Expect think, an invoice soon, Tom. I know, yeah. yeah. I, he's done it so long, Mike, and had so many different contests in so many different sports. When he was little, up to being about 12 years old, he went boxing fights, he went judo fights, jiu-jitsu fights, 
No, he didn't. He didn't have a judo fight. Did he? No, well, I've done. I've done everything. I've done everything. Don't, don't everything. And, and we used to go on a Saturday and just say, come on, we're going. And he never asked where or when or why. And he used to eat on the way there and I used to try and encourage that so he could, if he ever had to train, on, you know, when he was full. And he always wanted to be a fighter, so you've got to try and help along the way. And I was teaching jiu-jitsu. So I just tried as many things as I could to help him. And that's mm-hmm. always been the case. You know, that's all I'm, I'm still doing now. I don't do the fighting. I just help Tom. And I try and help his mindset, but you got to try and get everything right, haven't you? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I want to talk about that uh, a little bit more in a moment, but we, we've got to just keep it on the fight itself before we get into some of the deeper stuff and other things and your future and things like that. So I came back, I spoke to you, and you very humbly, Tom, said to me, have I got any last-minute advice? And essentially, I just said, be yourself, if you remember, because what you've done so far, you've proven – that, that you're going to do incredible things. You're going to have a long career. And it's, I think you're going to set many, many records. Um, we spoke about this Saturday now, but for people that weren't privy to that conversation, I said to you, when did the game plan switch up to trying to knock this man out? Obviously, he tagged you. You showed some great movement, some nice feints. The head movement was on point. You evaded a few of his shots. When you dropped him, when you landed that shot, talk me through that moment from your perspective. Now that, you know... The moment's kind of died down a little bit and you're kind of off cloud nine. Have you had time to reflect on that? Yeah, of course. Um, you know what? I feel like I've got a lot of power and it's it's overlooked by a lot of opponents because my movement and my other attributes are so good. But also, I carry a lot of power as well. And, you know, every time I knock somebody out, it, I don't mean to do it. It's just the loose shots that get them. Yeah, every time I think... Because I didn't throw the shots with any kind of malice and intent in them. I was just throwing them. I was just going to throw them, move off, kind of stick to the game plan, work on the calf kicks, like you say, faking in and out. That was kind of the game plan. And I wasn't charging forward, throwing bombs at him. You know, I was throwing a couple of shots and stepping off and and one of them landed pretty good. Um, And just a testament to my power is I punched him on the top of the head and still knocked him out, which is pretty, pretty rare against a guy who's never been knocked out before against a guy who's, absolutely steamrolling everyone else in the UFC and yeah pretty good feeling mate to be able to just bomb out someone like that that's pretty good I mean as you said it wasn't even a flush shot it wasn't like you threw the punch and the full fist connected on the jaw it was kind of like a glancing blow to the temple if I remember correctly I mean that does show your power um I mean, it was just a phenomenal moment, mate. Just a phenomenal moment. I, I know you believed in yourself, of course, your father and all your team and everyone around you and everyone in the UK. But there was a lot of people that thought that I was crazy for supporting you so much, that you were crazy, that Sergei Pavlovich was going to steamroll you. Did Were you aware of any of that chat? Oh, of course, of course. I'm not I'm not an idiot. I know, I know what's... Uh... I might seem like an idiot sometimes, but I know what. Actually, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, you don't, you don't. I seem like an idiot, and I act an idiot, and I'm always messing around and being silly and goofy. You seem like a well. You've got a re- tremendous fight IQ, and I'm sorry to take over. You're very grounded. You're very smart, and you can see that in your performances, Tom. Sorry, anyway. Thank you, but uh, yeah, I, I tried to stay off social media for the full thing, but obviously things creep through. You, you see stuff here and there, and. People on the comments, R.I.P. Tom. Tom's going to get steamrolled. This guy's the... You know what I mean? Everyone's saying all kinds of stuff. and um, I know I'm a nightmare for anyone, mate. I know it. I, I might not have the loudest mouth in the world shouting off all the time and making my... Because I'm confident. I don't need to do that. I know that if I hit someone once, not only if I hit someone once, I've not just got one shot. I've got a whole array of skills standing up on the ground. I've got all kinds of stuff that I've not shown yet. And I know that uh, I honestly believe that I'm the most dangerous man in the UFC. What do you think, Andy, when you see comments like R.I.P. Tom, as a father and knowing what he's capable of, what do you think? It's fair, I don't go on social media, Mike, so I'm, I'm all right. I think it's just a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it I'm is a waste of time. three kids and I, I, I spend, you know, quite a bit of time. I just don't. Everybody's got opinions, haven't they? So... I don't like social media because people put things on that they wouldn't say to you anyway. So, so you know, if they want to say something, just come and say it. Um, people put things on. You get people, lots of people tell me how he's trained in the daytime, but I'm with him all the time. And then when I say I was with him and they go, well, you weren't on the picture. I'm not bothered. 
not bother about getting on pictures, you know. So I'm from a different era, I think. You know, I'm a bit old yeah. and, and it doesn't bother me what people say. You know, all, all the beautiful time. pictures. Sorry, Andy. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's a different society now than when I grew up in. It doesn't, it's not about me. It's about Tom. I'm not bothered if nobody knows nothing about me. I don't like people commenting when he's just said that, but that's that. It doesn't affect me in any way what people say about you. you know, no, 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 I'm rightly so. I saw the pictures of you both though in Times Square. It must have been like three, four o'clock in the morning with the belt. I mean, yeah. coming from all the bars, we're trying to get in a bar and we couldn't find one. They, they yeah, closed, yeah. closed a lot. Well, I, I went to a place called Jack Dooley's or Jack Doylan's. Right. You should have given me a text, boys. If you weren't giving, if you weren't big leaguing me, we used to be mates. And straight yeah, away, the third, the first night he wins the bell, I don't even get a bloody text. You know, I told you the situation, Mike, the other day. Um, I'm not paying for that international data. I'm not bothered if I'm the champion of the world. No, I'm not paying for it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, couldn't, I, couldn't phone, text any, I couldn't text anybody. Yeah. I'm not paying them prices. Well, Tom won't use his phone. Over here in America, because it costs a lot and it's too cheap, right? Listen, you've got to be the heavyweight champion of the world. You can afford the international data. It's all perspective. Jesus. No. Well, next time you're there, Jack Doyle and stayed over to 4 p.m. There was a few of us there. You would have come and had a good time. But coming over, you know, coming from Atherton, the northwest of England, you know, it, it's it's a humble place. It's a beautiful place with amazing people. Uh, and a lot of those amazing people have tough lives. To fly out to Madison Square Garden. I mean, that is just, it's the most iconic venue on planet Earth. New York's a mental place, isn't it? You know yeah. what I mean? To stand there in Times Square, yeah. having that strap, having that belt. How proud were you, Tom? Pretty old. I, I wasn't even planning. That, that picture wasn't even planned. No, wasn't, no, um, wasn't. We just went for a walk, tried to get some food, tried to get in a bar. And one of my mates just had the belt on. Like, we were just walking around with a the belt. There were like 20, 30 of us <laughs> walking around. I didn't even notice. I, I forgot I even had the belt with me. So, uh, but yeah, pretty cool, especially yeah. my face and that being on the on the buildings over there. Like that was just unbelievable. It was amazing. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? You're gonna watch yourself in New York City, though, mate. There's a, there's a lot of rapscallions. There's a, there's a lot of dangerous, homeless, desperate people. You walk around with that big twelve pounds of bling, they'll have you, buddy. I know you're a big lad, but a hundred homeless people, they will take you down. <laughs> no, there was there was at least twenty heavyweights there. I reckon we would have <laughs> twenty heavyweights would have been would have been hundred homeless people. I reckon. Oh, without question. And, and and let's talk about that because you used to uh, train in Liverpool. You trained in uh, at, at another gym there. Um, and, and I know we had some conversations because obviously Darren Till trained there and he's a great friend and he's a great guy. But you've got to train with people your own size. Uh, now you've got this team around you. I mean, I always talk about it. I always joke about it. And I'm always... I'm always like a little uh, like a little chihuahua or Yorkshire terrier nipping at your lot heels. You know what I mean? When you come into London and I'm, uh, you, you're all massive. You all kick the flying shit out of me. But the only defense I've got is to pretend I can still take you all. And just it was just having a laugh. Do you know what I mean? But when you walk in, it's like the, the light goes because you're all monsters. You're all massive. And that's the type of people that you've got to train with. So talk to me about this training situation, Andy, which I believe you put together. And just talk to me about the evolution of just like, I don't know, finding a new gym, finding new training partners and trying to get to where you are today. Well, that, that probably started. Tom, I don't know if it's common knowledge or not, but Tom was doing MMA and it was really hard to get fights. And I, he was really good at jujitsu early on. And then he, he went to Team Carbon and he carried on doing jiu-jitsu and winning some jiu-jitsu comps and then he started doing MMA. And he had a... I can't remember what his record was at the time. It'll all be online when his record was. But I know Peter Fury and I said to Peter, can Tom come and do some boxing with Tyson to improve his boxing? And at the time, Tyson was going to fight Klitschko. So Peter said, bring him down and we'll see if he's all right. So Tom did a few rounds with Tyson that day along with, a, he had about four sparring partners in, four big sparring partners. And Peter watched Tom spar and he said, yeah, he's good. We'll give him a few quid for sparring. So that's what we did. And that went on until he fought and beat Klitschko. And after the fight, Peter said, does he want to carry on coming sparring? Because he's going to have a rematch with him. So we said, yeah, of course. But during, during the sparring or after the sparring at night, Tom said, geez, they hit hard, these heavyweights. 
And he wasn't sparring many heavyweights because there weren't many heavyweights at the gym. There was there was probably one who was regular. So that kind of rang alarm bells for me. You know that he's my son. And do I want him getting it with these big guys all the time and not being used to it? So after he'd done, I don't know, ever many weeks, a few of his months maybe, I said to him, are they hurting you now? He said, no, no, they're not hurting me at all. And then he was going back sparring at Cowbone and saying he couldn't feel shots then. You know, when smaller people were hitting me, he wasn't feeling any shots at all. Which is so, alarming. Well, it, it just, for me, then you think, right, he's got to be conditioned a bit better. So then he, he packed in MMA because we couldn't get fights. So he, he, he boxed there for maybe two years at Peter Fury's. Well, the dates will all be written down, you know. Um, Tom, how many boxing fights did you have, Tom? Just Sorry one. to interrupt I had, I had, some, I had some problem getting my licence and stuff, but yeah, just right. had one. Sorry. So he, no, it's all right. Yeah. So he had the one boxing fight, and then the first boxing fight he had, I'm not going to boring boxing details, but it, Peter got him against a guy who'd won 10 and lost 10 or 20, or whatever the number was, and Tom put him away in the first round. And then Peter said, right, we'll get you a better opponent. And, and they wanted the opponent paying, which Tom didn't like. But also, they build records in boxing, you know, so they get a bit of a paddy record. And he wanted to fight people on the same level as him. So I had a chat with Peter and said, look, he doesn't like it. And Peter was fine. He just said, well, come back whenever you want. You can train whenever you want. So Tom went back to Cobo, carried on training at Cobo. So that went on until he'd had the Cage Warriors fights, Maybe it was before the Volkov fight, and uh, Peter's got a friend called Dennis Crowwheel, who's Rico Verhoeven's coach. So Peter then said, Why don't you? Because we were going backwards and forwards to Peter's on odd weeks, doing some training there, because he was boxing the heavyweights there when, when he, he thought he needed some. So I we went to Dennis's gym in Holland, and he came away from there going, My legs are killing me. You know, they blasted his legs, Rico and, and, and Benjamin, Adik Bui, Benny. And, and Tom came up, and I thought, again, he's not getting the conditioning he needs. You know, we need big heavyweights. So then went back, and, and he'd had the Volkov fight, and there were no heavyweights at all in the gym. And there were a couple of lads this, from Aberdeen. This is the gym in Liverpool you were training the gym in at. Liverpool. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then there were a few lads that we knew from around here who trained at ASW at Atherton, and they said they wanted to train. My friend had a gym in Goldman, which is maybe five miles from us, so they trained in the morning. So we tried to get them to to come and train and they said no we want to train here or we don't want to train too much or we don't so we drafted Phil De Vries and Mick will they come down and train with us so they enjoyed training and it kind of just went from there really that he was training every day with big heavyweights Phil was disappearing and coming back and saying he's improved in the meantime so it, it just stuck really we just carried on doing that yeah, I feel I I thought like he lost confidence to think of it. I, I I feel like without training with heavyweights, I was just losing confidence. That's what I felt like, and it's no disrespect to Team Carbon or any of the other teams that I trained with, which didn't have heavyweights. It's just for me to get to the next level, I thought I needed to train with only heavyweights, exclusively heavyweights. And mate, since I've been doing that, my level has just gone absolutely through the roof. Yeah, and, and I'm not surprised. The reality is I don't need to tell you to. You've got to get pushed in the gym. If you're yeah, not getting pushed... Thing, in... That's another thing. I was feeling too comfortable in the mm. gym. I wasn't getting tested. I didn't. I wasn't motivated and I was feeling a bit unconfident. I needed to I needed to go on the, on the mat with like a bit of fear to keep me... To push me to the next level. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I couldn't go in and just coast through training. I wanted to push myself. If you're the top dog on the mat, in the ring, in the gym... You don't feel the pressure. You don't feel the nerves, the anxiety. And you just start making bad habits. Do you know what I mean? Everyone else in the room, if you're the top dog, they're going to improve. But you're going to start developing bad habits because you can get away with having your guard low or taking a shot or whatever the case may be. If they keep people keep you on your toes and they're pushing you to the limit and you've got to keep your fucking chin down and keep your hands up, you're going to improve. You're going to get better. You're going to be able to take down bigger guys and all the rest of it. Right? But yeah, I mean, that makes... It makes total sense. I mean, listen, I'm sure I'm sure it's uh, it's always hard when you change gyms, though. There's always internal politics. I mean, I had it. I used to trade at the Wolf's Lair. Um, and, you know, the, 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 yeah, that was a complicated situation, you know, and I, I left that gym and everyone started talking shit like, you know, he thinks he's better than everyone and all this type of stuff and he's got no loyalty. But it was a very complicated situation and I had to move on with the rest of my life, you know, as you've done, Tom, and, 
and rightly so. So my, now my, you're the my, my point, my point. I've kind of got a duty of care as a, as a father, and I was around, you know, fighters for a long time. If he's coming on and saying I'm getting hurt, the first you just alarm bells ring. The, the only thing I don't want to happen in this sport if he gets hurt, if he loses fights, he loses fights because somebody's better than him, you know. But mm. if he gets hurt and he's not been conditioned for that fight properly, then it's my fault, or it's somebody's fault. But well, now yeah. that's not happening, you know. He's Got big guys, you know. You, we don't smash in training. We, you know, we get better in training, and, and he's got to improve everything that he does. And every day, he's got to try and get better and better at doing what he does. And the training that I do now with him is just training for Tom Aspinall. You know, sometimes in a room of people, if you've got 20, 30 students, how do you make one of them really better than the other ones? At the minute, we've got between six and ten probably that come regularly. I only look at Tom. I just spend my time looking at Tom. And the other lads there know it's for Tom, but a few of them had fights and, and they've won. But, you know, they, they rub off on each other, I think, and we communicate really, really well. And I said to them, when, when you're here last time, what's different now with Tom? Well, his left leg's miles better, he's hitting me with that. And I never used to get caught with the left hook. And now he's improved that. So it's good. It's good for me and I enjoy it, mm. you know. No, of course, he's seen better, progress. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, to see him progress, he's the champ now. Um, Tom, how does that make you feel? Because it must be incredible, because my father was always so supportive. I was very lucky, but he didn't have a martial arts background. He couldn't coach me. You know, when I was a kid, he would drive me up and down the country all over the place. He came to every single one of my fights, supported me in every way he could. Um, so I always leaned on my father for advice and things like that. And I'm so grateful for everything that he did for him. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here now. But this is that to the next level. You know that Andy's only got, your father has only got the best intentions because sometimes, you know, the the level you're at now, the situation you're in, you know, Dana White talks about it. What does he call them? I don't know, the dirt bags or something like that. There's going to be people crawling out the woodwork. There's oh. going to be people coming after you. There's people, you know, you, you, you're hot property. You're the champion of the world, you know, and you're going to get a chance to unify that belt. But you know, whatever comes out of your dad's mouth, A, is the truth, and B, he's only got your best interest at heart. Yeah, well, exactly that. Exactly that. If something's not right, he's going to let me know. And uh, that's what he did when we were training at previous places. If it's not right, he's, he's going to work on changing it and he's not going to beat around the bush about it. Do you know what I mean? He, that's what he was saying to me. Um, like when I was training at Calvin, I had no training partners. He's going, listen, you're too comfortable here. That, like you're not getting prepared well enough. We need to change it up. So um, that's what we did. And the training situation now is... Fantastic, and that's no disrespect to the coaches at Cowboy or anything. Do you know what I mean? These, these, these are great coaches. The, the mm. issue was, is I need, I need heavyweights. Big guys need big guys. I'm not going to improve with training with lightweights, and uh, that's something that we spoke about at length, and that's something that my dad take care of, and I, I really appreciate it. You Peter train Fury, with Peter, first time it's Pete Fury's had four heavyweights there to try and hit Tyson, and he, and he had a, a I talked to him about it a few months ago. He stood in front of four of them and said, do you speak English to these guys? And he said, yeah. And, and they were massive, all of them. He goes, if you don't throw your biggest right hand at him now, you can get your bags from upstairs and piss off, he said. He said, because I'm paying you to do that because I know this other guy's going to do that against my fighter. Yeah. Now, if you have a middleweight throwing bombs at Tom, you can take him on the chin all day. Not all day, but you, it's got to be... Right, you know, and the boxing model has been there for years. You know, they wouldn't bring in middleweights or light heavyweights to spar with heavyweights when the heavyweights going for a world title. And yeah, no, of course. I mean, because I think Tom's last three fights have been his, not the Blades one, but he fell over in that. But the last three, the Volkov fight and Tybura fight and this fight, he said he's never felt as confident. Now, whatever percentage confidence is, it's a big percentage. And He's going in with that now, and he's going in with a, a healthier body because his knee's fixed. He's in better shape. He's a little bit heavier. He's definitely fitter and faster than he's ever been. And I'm not saying it. I'm, we prove it. We, we're timing, touching lights and flicking things and running from one place to another. 
lifting weights, snatching things up and down. Everything he does is getting better. Every camp he does. And then the spider partners that come in are similar, all the same. The same ones are saying he's getting better. We're going to Holland. We're going to see Peter. They're saying he's getting better. It's not. You know, there's, there's people looking at him and going, he's getting better. He's feeling better. He's winning, apart from the one where he, he hurt his leg. You know, that's all we can do, really. And back to the original thing is the duty of care that if he's going in and Francis and Baganu's throwing a bomb at him, and mm. Ganu throw a big bomb and he's him. You know, and I don't mm. want him getting hurt. I mean, you touched on something there, and it's so true, because as fighters, you know this, Tom, when you're walking out, when you're back there in the locker room, that's one of the most nerve-wracking moments before they come in and say, right, it's time to walk. Or, or you know, the fight before you is happening, you know, and you're like, oh, man, last-minute warm-up, let's hit the pads a minute, let's have a little stretch, you know, and you, then you got to get your mind right and all the rest of it. When I was in those situations, and I'm sure it's similar for yourself and all fighters, you take confidence knowing that you've left no stone unturned. You know what I mean? And if you're going out and you're running, you're lifting weights and you're doing everything you can, but you're not training with people your size, you know what I mean? That is going to start crawling into your mind. That's going to start sowing a seed of doubt. So I think you've done the right thing. You have to do that because if a bit of doubt creeps in, that can be an absolute nightmare for you. 100%. 100%. Like I said, the... The coaching that I've got over the years from from all my coaches, all through previous um, disciplines and everything, MMA, gyms, boxing, gyms, Thai boxing, gyms, wrestling, gyms, jiu-jitsu, gyms, everything, they've been great. But if I'm not training with big guys my size, I don't have the confidence. Simple as that. I don't know where I'm at. I can have all the technique in the world. But if I'm not training with guys my size, my confidence is gone because I don't know where I'm at. Whereas now it's like heavyweights every day, reality check every single day to know where I'm at. That's why yeah. I took a short notice fight because I know that I've been training with 10 heavyweights every day and I'm doing all right. So it, it's just a massive confidence boost. Yeah, you're right. And the thing, you, Mike, you, you, every, every day, day now, we don't we don't have jiu-jitsu days, we don't have boxing days, we don't have wrestling days. We have MMA days for Tom Aspinall. Mm. That's yeah, and, and, and rightly so. And i got to say, Tom, again, you're well, so sorry, really Sorry, heavyweights as well, Mike. You know, yeah. I'm not practising escaping from omoplatters and doing triangles and stuff like that. All the stuff yeah. that I think is a bit wasted on what he would do, he's gone. And I know exactly I mean, what he can do because I, I watched him crawl. I watched him learn to climb. I watched him... And, and I've been there a million hours. So I know which hand he switches wrong and I know where he, his feet get confused a little bit. And I, I can... It's kind of like doing one of those things that's a bit of me because I've seen it so much. And the number of hours, and I said, I've said this this last week, the number of hours I've spent in the garage with him, having surgeries on my knees, because you know this, bits keep breaking off him because he keeps kicking my legs. I've had two neck surgeries that he's probably <laughs> what not done. Head, Tom? He's out. Listen your dad's legs up. Apologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apologies. But, but for, for, for until being about 20 or 21, so probably five or six years of his good coming an adult life, I was sparring partner every single afternoon. It wasn't funny, but it, now mm. I can look back and say, I did it, and, but, but, but it, it, it was no fun. But I, I know how he spars because he's kicked me. I know how he punches because he's punched me. I know how he grapples because he's grappled me. You know, and I can Purpose see... Purpose served, though. Purpose served. I mean, you Purpose said the more than yeah, it's nice now because you can reflect and go, oh, good. But if you got knocked out, if Pavlovich had hit him three times instead of once, it might be a different story today. And that's the sport. You know, he's in a sport that's very, you know better than anyone. It's very dangerous. You can get cut open. You can get many surgeries. I want him to stay away from as much of those as he can. You want him to stay healthy my... in his long age. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. when, when, this is all well and good. It's incredible. You know, I mean, you get to the yeah, top of the sport it, it, world. It, it, you make money, you get a bit of fame, and I know that doesn't interest in you whatsoever, Tom, but it's just what it's all yeah. part of the process, it just comes along with it. But eventually that all goes away. Do you know what I mean? And then you're left with the memories, you're left with your legacy, and you're left with hopefully some a nice amount of money in the bank and you live a nice life. But health is wealth. You know what I mean? As you're getting older, and if you fucking had the shit kicked out of you because you didn't 
find the correct, appropriate training environment to be in. You know what I mean? You'd never forgive yourself. Now, you said a moment ago, Tom, you said, I'm doing all right. Again, the humility. I mean, that's a bit of an understatement, mate. Bit of an understatement. Doing all right. You're the interim champion of the world. Now, I'm going to throw something at you here. I don't know. Have you seen Henry Cejudo's comments? No, I don't watch that little squirt. (laughs) (laughs) Good for you. Good for you. (laughs) Listen to what this little rat had to say. Listen, Henry's all right. I don't mind Henry, right? But here is what he said. He said, hold on. And I'm just saying this so you can get your response. He said, uh, the headline here is, Henry Cejudo craps on an emotional Tom Aspinall for weepy interim title win. It's not the real thing. He says, watching Tom Aspinall win the interim title, he's already celebrating. It's an interim, Tom. Save those tears for when you actually win the belt. Sometimes when I see people like that, they just get too emotional after an interim belt. Yeah, you got a trophy. But they might as well dip that thing in either silver or bronze because it's not the real thing. Tell him he was weeping about the money, Mike. He got so much money. <laughs> <laughs> he I, mean, <laughs> I mean, what were... Why I think he's, that's, that's just Henry Cejudo being Henry Cejudo. And, you know, I was just talking to someone about that, Anthony Smith, and Anthony had a great take on that. He actually said, you know, it's easy for someone like a Henry Cejudo to say that or a Daniel Cormier, people that have been two weight division champions, people that have been to the Olympics and been Olympic gold medalists, you know. But did you just ignore that, Tommy? You just shut that out and just ignore that and take it for what it no. is? Uh, it doesn't matter to me, mate, what he says, to be honest. Yeah. He's about five foot three. That's, uh, <laughs> if he spoke, I probably wouldn't hear him. He's that far away from me. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Mate, why, you reckon, why would anybody you, you reckon your dad would have him? I reckon he'd And do they it, come yeah. on, you versus him. You're about the same height. I reckon he'd I'm do five it. foot eight. Are you really? Why? Yeah, yeah, I think Why? it's just because you're always with Tom, who's massive. Yeah, so I always think you look so short, but obviously you're five eight. You're not that short, yeah. but yeah. And next to Tom, it's it's the camera effect. You know what I mean? But why why would anybody say something like that apart from to get themselves? Well, he's noticed. trying to get he's trying to get headlines, isn't he? He's trying to get headlines, obviously. Ah, he's trying whatever. to get clicks for his YouTube channel. Yeah, that's yeah, all yeah. it is. Yeah, we've all been there, Mike, haven't we? Yeah, we've all been there, buddy. Yeah. And, and he's he's mates with John Jones as well. Okay, that's fair enough, mate. What, whatever, yeah. I'm not really bothered. But it's about. back to that world again, mate. You know where everybody wants to just be popular. Or if if somebody doesn't know him, why would they say anything? If somebody does know him and and likes him, why wouldn't they say something nice? You know, I don't know. It's a funny world. Yeah, well, I don't see honestly, Tom. I haven't known you that long. You know, we we met since you through your UFC career. Yeah, and I'm I not just saying this because kind of, yeah. Part of, well, you have loaned him a long time, of course. He's from your loans, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, You've come across always to me, Tom, as one of the most stand-up, honourable, decent, humble, fucking deadly human beings I've ever met. And I'm proud to know you, Tom. I'm proud Thank to you. know you. So you do a good job because you always shut all that stuff out. Yeah, Thank you. you. Uh, and you're so in control problem. of your emotions as well, which is a hard thing to do. Yeah, it doesn't bother me. What, what bothers me is when someone I know has an issue and... They've got my number, but they want to, they want to go to online to beef it to beef it up. If you got an issue and you got some questions, give me a ring. Do you know what I mean? What, oh, is there something what? going on? No, no, I just mean in general. Just that that's what annoys me is when it's people I know. When it's when it's strangers, I couldn't care less, mate. Couldn't care less. When it's someone I know and respect, um let, let's let's chat about it. Do you know what I mean? You don't have to you don't have to turn to online about anything. Let's uh if there's any questions there, let's let's talk it over. But if it's someone I don't know, it doesn't bother me. As you said before, Andy, that's just the world we live in, sadly, with yeah. social media and technology. You know, and, and as and, and as your star gets bigger, Tom, and it is, it's gonna get bigger and bigger. You're gonna get more of that. I think with somebody like yourself and how you carry yourself, it's for the most part, 90%, 95%, it's all going to be positive. But there's always those dickheads out there. There's always going to be people that want to see you fail. There's always going to be people that support your opponent and things like that. So, But you're doing the right thing. Just ignore them. They're not important to you, your family, your life, your career, your children. So they don't matter. Talk to me about John Jones. Obviously, he's the champion. Or in fact, the situation. Stipe versus John Jones. I know you spoke to Ariel about it, uh, but I never saw the interview. Um, and I'm sure everyone's asking you this. 
Yeah. Um, thoughts on the entire situation, what you want, temperature, what are the UFC saying? Well, what I've, do not we know? Nothing, I've not heard nothing from the UFC. Um, I think John Jones should be stripped to the title, to be honest, because everyone else does when they get injured like that. I don't see why he's still got it. I don't understand that. I think I should be the real champion right now. And I, I, it's hard to say without sounding rude, but who's asked about John Jones and Stipe anymore? Like, what? why do we get this legacy fight and they get to live by their own rules? What's a legacy fight? What's a retirement fight for a title? That's not... I want to fight Stipe and then I want to fight John Jones is what I want to do to answer your question. I think all this other yeah. stuff's a load of rubbish. Stop protecting him now. Stop protecting your boy at the top there, John Jones. If he's injured, get out of the way. I'll fight Stipe. I mean, you make a lot of good points. I mean, you you really do because if Jones is in... I, I, all right, let's play devil's advocate, right? Yeah. I work for the UFC. We all know there was a massive demand for that fight. There's a big yeah. demand for that fight and... They can make a lot of money off that fight. Jones can make a lot of money. Steve Baker can make a lot of money. You know what I mean? So, and if they're all happy to wait, I kind of get that. But from your perspective, one million percent, I get it because the natural flow of things should be all right. Well, Jones isn't available. You are available. And if Steve is good enough, then on paper, he should beat you and then get to fight Jones anyway. I'm yeah, assuming that's like, how you that, feel, right? That, that fight is completely dead in the water now. We've got a new champion at the weight, which is me. We've got Stipe, who's, by the time John Jones come back, will have fought once in four years, and he'll be 42 years old. And his one fight that he had, he got knocked out. And now he's going to fight Jones, who's coming off a big injury, who's had, again, one fight in three years. Like, who's going to be bothered about that fight in a year's time? Like, let's move on. I'm the champion now. I'll fight Stipe. He's available. Me and Stipe will fight. And when I beat Stipe, I'll fight John Jones. Yeah. I mean, you're willing to take them all on. Yeah. As I a champion it's, it's, sport. it's sport, isn't it? That the light heavyweight guys moved aside when they got injured. And I've not thought about it at all. But if they move aside, why don't the heavyweight guys move aside? And and if Tom fights one of them and wins, fight the other one. Let's keep it going. Like, if he loses, the other guy will be fit and he can fight him then, can't he? Let's keep the ball rolling, I say. Like, obviously, John Jones is injured, so he's out of the picture. He's completely out of the picture for a while. Stipe isn't injured. I'm the champion. Give me Stipe. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, no, it's no, not rocket science, is it? It's no, not it's, it's not rocket science. And it's I see the logic completely. What I the think, I think the only barrier... Stuff, all this oh, rubbish stuff, like, they're just making up their own rules, mate. Like, a legacy fight. What What on earth is that? Why, why are they hanging out for a year for a legacy fight when they've got another champion? What, or, or a retirement fight. I have a retirement fight, but don't hold up the whole division because of it. You got another champion here ready to go. If there's one guy free at the top, Stipe, put him against the champion, which is me. Yeah, yeah. No, no, oh, this is belt. Yeah, I'm a legacy belt then. I'm a legacy belt if you want to do that. You can't just make your own rules up. You know what I mean? Like, you've got an active champion here who's just steamrolled the number one in the division and knocked him out in a minute. The one that the guy that no one wanted to fight. Stipe's free. Let's go. Hmm. Mm. No, I, I can see you fired up about this, Tom, and rightly so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's enjoying this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, is that your plan? You're just going to start making a lot of noise. Any interviews and all the rest of it, you're going to start just calling out Stepe. Eh? Obviously, Jones is out for a bit. Um, is that the plan? Just, just, well, just, I, I, don't, just... I don't know. I don't know. I've not got a plan of action to be honest. But I don't want to wait until bloody a year for them two to fight and then wait another year to fight the winner. And also, no. what's the point in fighting for an interim title if I'm not going to fight the champion next? Or I'm not going to fight for the championship next? Like right now, I'm the number one active heavyweight in the world. That's a fact. Active, I'm saying. Active yeah. right now. Yeah. I won't, I'll never be the number one until I beat John Jones, who is the actual champion. I'm, I'm aware of that. But I'm talking about active champions. Best heavyweight in the world right now is me. So the second best active guy right now is Stipe. It's common yeah. sense. Stop talking about legacy ball. <laughs> you can't make your own rules up. Hey, as I said, you can't argue with the logic. 
And I totally get it. I totally understand. I, th- I think the, the issue is, is, and it's not an issue, is that Dana set, has stated, he stated at the press conference, right? The post-fight press conference, he said, that's still going to go ahead. So what are you going to do in the meantime? If that steep air fight doesn't happen, which according to Dana, isn't going to. And who knows? Things change. Time changes everything. Who yeah. knows what's going to happen in the future? One day it's this, tomorrow it might be that. But of course, you can't sit on the sidelines for 18 months. No. So you're going to defend the interim belt. I mean, that, that would be my. Well, you would have to be. You can't be a prisoner, can you? I wouldn't have well, thought. Why have I got to defend an interim belt? I, I'm, I'm the champion right now. Like, I should fight for the championship title. The, the actual champion is unavailable for the first. They're, they're talking about a year at least. Like, that's. And and that's on a guy with a lot of miles on the clock who is still unsure if he's going to retire or not. Like, let's keep it moving. So are you asking John Jones to relinquish the belt like Jamal and Yuri? Re- relinquish the belt and you'll give him the shot when he comes back? They did, didn't they? Well, they right. did. They did, yeah. They did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, no, I'm head. saying is that essentially what you're asking for? Because it, it's it's not crazy. Because I understand what you're saying. I I, I, I clearly it. hear your frustration. I, I don't want to sound disrespectful about it. Do you know what I mean? I, I have a lot of respect for John Jones and Stipe. But mm. if John Jones isn't available, the other guy who's available who's fighting for the title is Stipe. So me and Stipe should fight for the for the title, not the interim title, the actual one. No. And the other thing, Mike, is it. He said before he fought, he's put, I can't win, it's sat on the couch. But he can't he can't be a fighter sat on the couch either when he's fit. You know, he's fought, since he fought Blades, he's fought for a couple of minutes in the last 18 months or something. It's not a lot. Yeah, and listen, listen, not listen. I, I totally get it. 100, and you're in your prime and you're ready That's to right. go. And you yeah. fought 69 seconds last Saturday. No so injuries. you want to get back in no, there. Not injured now. Yeah, exactly. Have you reached out to the UFC and said, "Listen, what is the plan?" Oh, yeah, th- not yet. You're thirty, not, right, Tom? Not sorry. You're thirty. Yeah, I'm thirty. Yeah, I'm not even in my prime yet. I've got another ten years to go. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I've not, reached out. I've not reached out yet. Um, I know I'm not going to fight this year. That's for sure. So I'll, I'll let a bit of time pass, see what happens. But um, I'm not waiting for two years to fight. You know what I mean? It's, it's not happening. I need to fight. Um, but I'll tell you some one thing. Cyril Gann's waiting. I'm not fighting him. Oh, really? No Cyril Gann? No. Because... Why is that? Because I did the work on him. I did the work. I called him out after my fight. Turned it down. Doesn't want to fight me. I then showed up in his hometown in Paris. Openly said on the microphone, to you, I believe, that he doesn't want to fight me. Then went on Ariel Hawani's show and said he doesn't want to fight me. Now I've got the title. He wants to leapfrog everybody else and fight me. No, mate, you can wait. What about before the title? I called you out three or four times. Okay. All right. I understand that. Just play on the other side. If you want to fight again, yeah. why not just say, fuck it then? Come on, Cyril. Have it. Yeah. He can fight Almeida first and I'll fight the winner of that. Yeah, no, no. I understand you don't want to give it on his terms. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I I understand you want to give it on his terms, but if you just take the emotion out of it, as opposed to letting him pick the shots, and I get that as fighters, we don't want that. We don't want someone someone else being in control and being in charge, you know. But if 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 you want to fight, and and that could be a juicy fight. I mean, I would well, favour you to win fight. with the yeah, grappling. It's a great fight. I, th- I think it's been it, it, for years, but on my terms, not just you can't be this entitled kid and and just fight for the title whenever he wants. Earn it. Earn it. I've called him out loads of times. Go and earn it. Fight Almeida. I'll fight the winner. No problem. What if the UFC said that's the only fight they'd entertain? Nah, they'll do me and Stipe. You think so? You you, yeah. you think that you think you'll be able to make that happen? Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. I'd like. I mean, that that is the fight. That if you ask me, that's the fight. I get that. Fight, so right? you're yeah. saying that you don't want to fight Cyril because you think the the Stipe fight will materialize? Yes. Yes. Got you. Got you. Not, not just that, mate. I've done the work for Cyril. I did the work. The fight was offered him a million times. He said, no, 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 until I had the belt and now he wants it. So mm. you, you go and do some more work then. You do some more yeah. work. I'll fight Stipe in the meantime, then we'll fight. Yeah. I mean, who else is there? Let's be honest. No. I mean, obviously, <laughs> Gilton Almeida. Yeah, he looks, mean, good. I, he looks good from what I've seen. Yeah, he looks, looks You know, Derek Lewis had, had a tough one. Um, 
I, 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 I honestly, I texted to you the other day, and I truly mean this. I, I, I struggle. I mean, Anthony Smith was just talking about it on the podcast. We, we really, really struggle, and we're not kissing your ass. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, just doubling down on what I've always said ever since I've known you, which is a short amount of time. Um, I don't, I don't see anyone in those rankings that's going to give you any kind of issue. If I'm honest, you never know, mate. It's heavyweight. You never Correct. know. Correct. Of course. Well, skill for skill, I believe I'm better than all of them. And Cyril on the feet would be would, would be a very interesting fight, right? People would want to see that. The problem is you're multifaceted, you know, and yeah, yeah I'm sure you, you're happy to stand with him. You just knocked out Cyril Garn, so it's Cyril Garn, Sergei Pavlovich. So yeah. it's not like you're going to, you know, be intimidated, you know, but he is very good on the feet, but you've got more ways to skin a car. He's definitely good. He, yeah, I'm not I'm not denying how good he is. He is good. Mm. I, that's why I yeah. wanted to fight him. I wanted him to fight. Um, but I got the equaliser. Oh, yeah. Very oh, cool. there it is. Talk to me about that moment when you walked home. I know you said the kid was like, he's number one, Dad. He's dangerous. He's not number one anymore. You're number one. You walk in. You've got the belt. Talk me through that moment. Yeah, I managed to get in just before they went to school on uh, Monday morning. And you know what the best thing was, right? They didn't give a shit if I just won the title or not. They were just happy that Dad was home. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So Beautiful that, feeling. That, that's better than anything. That, like, if I would have lost, I would have got the same reception from him. So... That, that's great. That's priceless, that. Yeah. No, no, it's amazing. I'm just looking here because i got some questions for you from everyone on the YouTube channel. So I want to read these out to you, Tom, because there's a few good ones, a few fun ones. I don't know what these are going to be like. There's a couple Go of on. funny ones. I looked at them before. Oli Oli says, the Northwest accounts for the biggest proportion of fights from any area of the UK. Aspinall, Bisping, Fury, Darren Till, to name just a few. What's it about the Northwest that makes us so talented? I got asked this the other day as well. Someone else asked me this. I don't know. I don't. What do you reckon it is? I have no what idea. What it told me is it's because the they're all there are a lot of mining towns, and and they were we were bred years ago from tough miners. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's that. I heard Joe Rogan talking oh, recently yeah. on a podcast saying that all the great boxers in America come from the tough, real tough working class towns. You know, whether it's yeah. things like that. HSPA018 says, how much do you normally weigh outside of a fight, Tom? Uh, it depends. My, my weight fluctuates a lot. Obviously, I'm a bit heavier this time because um, I wasn't training as hard as I usually do. <laughs> so I know. I thought much. you looked a bit fat on the scale, mate. I was yeah, like, jeez, Tom's letting stuff go. I'm like a sirloin, top quality sirloin steak, aren't I? Good, good beef, a little bit of fat on the outside. I was, I, I was like, for fuck's well, sake, Tom, you're fighting for the fucking belt. Yeah, well, Get yourself I, in shape, lad. A bit longer than two weeks' notes would have been good. Here we go. We've got, we got, we got the plug going in. We've just got a I've few got... questions, then we'll let you go and enjoy yourself. It's going to die on me. Go on. Stick I'll her see. in. Stick her I'll in. I'm going to face guy. I'm going to face a guy. Time. got dedication. We're going to FaceTime. Lewis Smith, 845. Have you treated your dad to anything nice since you won the belt? No. No. Nope. Cheap nope. bastard, Andy. I know. I know. He's got the belt. He's got the belt. That's all he needs. He's happy with that. Has he got the belt at his house? No. No, the belt's in a secret location right now, so no one can steal it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliant. Uh, same James says, which fight in the UFC past or present would you compare yourself style-wise? I'll answer that first. George St. Pierre, a heavyweight George St. Pierre, I have you have. As well, that's a massive compliment. It, I mean, that's who I'm trying to be like. Um, yeah. I don't think our styles are exactly the same, but that's definitely what I'm aiming for. In my opinion, he's the best of all time, so... I'm aiming for him. Yeah, what I meant by that was the versatility, you know, and, yeah, and how yeah. agile you are as a heavyweight, you know. Uh, Racing one-on-one says, I don't train MMA, but I injured my shoulder and was wondering how do you get back into your routine after healing? And what did you use as motivation to get through? Bit of a crappy question there, Racing one-on-one. Tom doesn't want to give you bloody physical no. advice. Just get back in the routine, bro. Simple as that. Don't even think about it. Crack on. Richard Guzman, Tom, huge fan. Pretty basic question. How would it feel beating someone at the level of a Jones or a Stipe? And how hard did Sergey hit you? Well, that's what I'm aiming to achieve, beating the, one of the legends. That's what I want. I want. Um, I want a legacy. I, I want a legacy fight. Do you know? I want to fight one of the legends. I, I want to fight a former champion like that, or a champion right now. And that's part of the reason I want to do it. I don't want to fight. You know, I want, I want that on my resume. Um, Sergey, it didn't feel too bad at the time, but when I watched it back, I was like, oh, that was a bit of a, 
Bit of a good Did one. Did you always find though? No pain? Yeah, no, no, absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. Because I mean, well, when you get cracked with a good one, sometimes the next day you can't close your teeth to Yeah, no, you know it, what it, I'm it, talking it about. Wasn't, it wasn't one of them. Everything good. Right, right. Sergey, it's like a little girl. We heard it here no, first. No, no, I'm not saying that, mate. I don't I don't fancy <laughs> sticking another one. One's enough. <laughs> Gary Bags 2325. Will you make your first defense in London? Hopefully. Hopefully. Or Manchester, ideally. The UK would be amazing for a pay-per-view card. I like the idea of that. There's a couple of uh, events maybe coming up soon. I'm not saying anything. Uh, Chris, Christopher Russell says 4411. Uh, Christopher Russell 44. What do you think about Leon Edwards wanting to go up, wanting to go up to middleweight? First of all, I think Leon Edwards is fantastic. Let me start by saying that. This is the first I've heard of it. Um, it's up to him. It's, up to, it's, it's his choice, his career. Um, do whatever you want. Two more left. I've got one more softball, and then it is the real granddaddy of all questions. Go Ready? On. Yeah. First of all, the softball. Simon Fletcher, 7012, says, how does it feel knowing that you're the baddest man on the planet? I also think, by the way, you could do Francis in round one. That's what Simon Fletcher says. Um, I've not really thought man that. on the planet, barring me, Tom. Barring yeah, me. well, I don't know about that. But I'm, I'm, no. I'm gonna, we're going to get the gloves on one day, Tom, but take it easy. I don't. Uh, I've not really We're going to have about. a little move around. I'll give yeah, you a go. I'll, we, I'll have a little right. move. You think you can. You think you can. I'm down to 216 pounds now, Tom. I've lost a bit of weight. I'm back in the game. I'm moving. You do look slim. I'm you do look, you did look lean. You did look lean when I saw you the other day. Um, I'm coming Yeah, I've not really thought about it too much. I've not really thought about it too much. I'm just cracking on with my life. I, I enjoy yeah. my life. So I don't think about stuff like that. And that's great. And that's why everyone loves you. And here's the final question. First question that popped into the mind of T. Barrett, 1984. On a bacon butty. Brown sauce or red sauce? Fruity brown sauce. No, I, I, I think I think that's my dad's fruity brown sauce, apparently. But I like red. I think red, red. sauce all day. Yeah, for me, for me. It's red. It, full full English is that a big favourite of yours? I had a full English the other day. Yeah, yeah, it was excellent. Love it. What's on the fry up? Bacon, sausage, egg, tomato. Uh, three, I threw some. Big- Controversial. I don't think I don't think egg really goes that much. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is the crazy stuff. This is the important stuff. Bacon and egg doesn't go. No, it does. But as I think egg and beans more doesn't go, in my opinion. I swear it's just a bit weird. Beans. Yeah. Oh no, beans gotta go. That's some southern shit. That and no beans. Yeah, you gotta have beans. Gotta... No, no beans, mate. We're farting all day. Oh, that's all right with me. That's all right. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. You need the fuel. All right. Well, listen, there it is. Q&A session with Tom Aspinall done. Hope you all enjoyed that one.